you can only cut a diamond using another diamond. It's the hardest natural material on our planet. Between retrieving the stones from the earth and the finished products you see in jewelry stores, a diamond goes through a complex process. Before they cut it, people need to consider which shape is best for the stone, so they don't throw too much of it away. One town in Norway, located north of the Arctic Circle, wants to become the first time-free zone in the world. The sun doesn't go down there at all between May 18th and July 26th. The locals don't want to follow the classic concept of time to get the most out of their 24 hours. Since they have constant daylight, they can't just act like the rest of the world. You can sometimes see people playing soccer in the middle of the night there or mowing their lawns and painting their houses at 2 a.m. The Leaning Tower of Pisa is tilted because the soil under the building's surface is really soft. This was probably frustrating for the people who constructed it, but they eventually figured out the soft soil is part of the reason why the tower is safer from earthquakes. Because of the softness of the soil and the tower's stiffness and height, the tower doesn't resonate with earthquake vibrations. So the reason the tower is tilted is exactly why it's still standing, even in such an unusual position. You don't actually see pitch black in a pitch black room. It's a specific phenomenon where you see dark light, or as people also refer to it, brain gray. It's a dark gray background many people see in the absence of light, and some even call it visual noise, since it's like an ever-changing field of small black and white dots. Watermelon is definitely one of the most refreshing and hydrating fruits, especially during hot summer days. But if you try some watermelon-flavored candies like gummy or hard candies, they're usually either mouth-puckeringly sour or very, very sweet. They aren't at all like the actual watermelon. It's basically impossible to replicate the great taste in the overly acidic-tasting watermelon candy. That's because its main chemical compounds are rare and watermelon flavoring uses blends of cheap synthetic artificial flavors. Making high-quality realistic flavoring for candies and juices is possible, but would cost businesses a lot. Some people love the fake watermelon flavor, but most stick to their perception of how that fruity taste should be and are not fans of it. Why is there an expiration date on a water bottle? Of course, water doesn't go bad, just like salt or sugar. But even though water doesn't go bad, the plastic bottle does. When it starts expiring, it leaches chemicals into the water. It won't make the water toxic, but it can change its taste, so you might not get the mountain spring fresh water you expected. Another reason for the expiration date on bottled water is there's a rule all consumable food products, including water, need to have an expiration date. Also, many companies that produce these bottles use the same machines for bottling sodas and some other beverages, and these do expire. So it's way easier to just put a stamp on all bottles, whether necessary or not, than to buy new special machines just for bottles of water. Fingerprints are not just something that's unique to humans. Gorillas and chimpanzees have fine ridges on their fingertips too. They also seem to be unique to individuals. So we all probably inherited this from a common ancestor. Why does a green screen come in green and not some other color? When you film someone in front of a green screen, it's a technique known as chroma keying. The green color gets digitally filtered out so that you can replace it with any footage you want to add. If the subject you're filming is wearing something green, the background image fills that in as well. That's why it gives the impression the person you're filming has holes in them. And green is good for this since it resembles human skin tones the least. Why do you feel dizzy after spinning? There are hairs lining the sides of tiny tubes filled with fluids that are located in your inner ear. When you move your head, these hairs detect acceleration, which means a change in the speed of a certain object. If you spin for long enough, your brain can't deal with the constant turn signals from your ear, and the way it adjusts is to zero them out. At the moment you stop, your ears report zero turning correctly, but your brain is still in the mode where it actively cancels this out it actually thinks that you have now started spinning in the opposite direction. So, how can ice skaters do all those amazing things on the ice and not feel dizzy? When doing a pirouette, they lock their eyes on a fixed point and keep it that way. They whip their head around really fast when they're not able to twist their neck further. Their spins are really fast, so they gradually train to overcome the feeling of dizziness and learn how to keep their eyes horizontal. That way, the view is spinning around one axis only. 
Neutron stars aren't that heavy, they're just really dense. So dense that just one teaspoon of a neutron star would weigh 1 billion tons. They are the densest and the smallest type of star we know of. Imagine squeezing 1.4 times the mass of our Sun into a sphere no bigger than 6 miles across. They're dense because of the way they form. The balance between an outward pressure process in its core and the gravitational force that tries to contact a star hold it together. When a star loses its supply of fuel, gravity wins, contracts the star, and eventually makes it collapse. When stars between 8 to 20 masses of the Sun collapse, this squeezes their core to be super dense. Their outer layers rebound and BAM! Here's a supernova. It leaves behind an extremely dense neutron star. If a star has 20 solar masses or even more, the core doesn't collapse into a neutron star, but into a black hole instead. When you spend a day at the beach playing volleyball, swimming, or doing some other physical activities, you expect to be exhausted. But even when you spend a whole day just chilling around, you'll probably end up just as sleepy. Your body still gets very tired because it's doing a lot, even though you can't see it. First, it's always working to maintain your internal temperature. When it's hot outside, it requires way more effort, and your body cools off in a way it dilates your blood vessels. This boosts blood flow and helps your blood get closer to your skin. Over there, it can offload excess heat. That's also why some people blush when they're hot. You sweat more when it's hot outside, again, to cool down. And your metabolic and heart rate both increase, so you lose a lot of energy even when you're just lounging around at the beach. Why do animals have differently shaped pupils? The pupil is a hole in the iris of your eye that lets light pass through the retina. The iris muscles change the size of the pupil, which affects the amount of light that passes through. Because our muscles are placed in a ring that contracts equally towards the center, our pupils are round. This brings certain benefits. It provides consistent focus over the whole field of view. But circular pupils are unable to constrict as tightly as some other shapes of pupils. Animals that hunt or are prey to bigger animals evolve to have big, sensitive eyes at night. Bright daylight is just overwhelming for them. That's why they have an extra set of muscles that pull the pupil into a narrow slit shape in daily light. Predatory animals have vertical slit pupils, like many snakes and cats. Such pupils help them to have sharper focus across the horizontal field of view and determine better how far their prey actually is. Mesopotamia Coffee was pretty important when it came to marriage. Men would choose their future wives based on how well they could make coffee. Luckily, we have coffee machines for that today, so we choose partners based on their personalities. And in Constantinople, a wife could file for divorce in case her hubby did not provide her with enough coffee. According to industry standards, you need around 56 coffee beans to make a single shot of coffee. Beethoven, yes, I'm talking about one of the main hit makers of all time, would count 60 beans precisely to brew his morning coffee. I guess it was more of a ritual than a particular recipe. Hey, do you have any rituals for your morning, Joe? Another hit maker, Johann Sebastian Bach, even dedicated a cantata to coffee, which he called coffee cantata. Pretty straightforward, huh? The cantata tells about coffee dependence. Even though black coffee is supposedly the most common type out there, pretty much everyone tried cappuccino at least once. By the way, it got its name because of the final color the drink has. It's a soft brownish shade, very much similar to the color of the capuchin robe. Plus, the robe has a hood, and the word hood translates to Italian as cappuccio. Now the name finally makes sense. Those who don't like to spend time brewing coffee often opt for the instant variety. Let's say happy birthday to instant coffee. It's soon to turn 116 years old. It was invented in 1907, and up until the 1970s, many consumers would criticize it for having an inferior taste. However, in the 1970s, the technology changed, and the manufacturers claimed it tasted almost like freshly brewed coffee. Also, instant coffee created another popular thing, coffee vending machines. The first prototype was invented back in 1947, and they've been with us ever since the 1950s. There are also some products you don't really want to combine coffee with. Number one, meat. 
The logic is simple. Coffee can absorb zinc in the body. Therefore, it's not the best choice to have coffee after grabbing something that contains zinc. I'm talking about red meat, oysters, and beans. Number two, fried food. Such dishes tend to contain a lot of so-called bad fats. And once you combine them with caffeine, this mix increases the cholesterol levels in your body. Number three may come as a surprise, but still, coffee and milk aren't the best match. Coffee doesn't let the calcium absorb, so technically, you just don't get many nutrients from the milk. Japan seems like the perfect place for those who love coffee. I mean, do you know any other place where you can literally bathe in coffee? Me neither. So this hot springs spa and water amusement park near Tokyo got famous for its extraordinary hot tubs. There are 26 baths in total, and they're filled with coffee, green tea, and many other drinks. Only fresh ingredients are used, and the baths get refilled every day. So to make a coffee tub, they brew coffee beans with water from natural hot springs. By the way, the price is pretty reasonable. An adult ticket costs about $36. If you tried to make a coffee tub yourself, you'd probably spend more. Time to debunk another myth. Decaf coffee does have caffeine. A middle-sized decaf drink has about 7 milligrams of caffeine, while regular coffee has about 7. Yep, 10 times less, but it's enough to disrupt your sleep. As for classic coffee, remember that caffeine has a 6-hour half-life, so it takes about 12 hours to fully eliminate it from your body. Coffee is a no-go both before you go to sleep and right after you wake up. Cortisol, the stress hormone, is not only responsible for stress, but for sleep cycles too. It spikes between 8 a.m. and 9 a.m., so a cup of coffee only adds to anxiety in the morning. Grab it when the cortisol is at its lowest. It also spikes between noon and 1 p.m. and between 5.30 and 6.30 p.m. No coffee at this time. Many people believe coffee is not the healthiest drink, opting for good quality water or other beverages. Still, if you just can't say no to your guilty pleasure, try buying a thermo cup and brewing coffee at home. You'll save money and nature since the disposable coffee cups aren't recyclable and it takes at least 20 years for them to decompose. A pop-in in a coffee shop may be your daily ritual, but have you ever counted how much you spend on your morning habit? Millennials spend over $2,000 a year on coffee, investing sometimes more than they do in their retirement. Now, can you honestly tell me you have never used your phone while driving? I know, me too. But we both know that it can be dangerous. To help with this, some newer cars have a special feature called a heads-up display. This option shows important driving information in front of you, like speed and directions, so you don't have to look away from the road. It's like a floating screen on the road in front of you. This can help you drive safer and avoid getting a ticket for going too fast. Not all cars are so modern, so to drive safely, you need to put your phone away. Thankfully, some cars have special places for your phone while you're focused on the road. One specific 2021 model, Chrysler Pacifica, has a feature where the second row of seats can be folded down into the floor. It's good for carrying big items. But when the seats are up, these areas are good for storing things out of sight. Just remember to check and clean them out every once in a while, because they can become magnets for all sorts of knickknacks, like french fries or wet swimsuits that will surely start to smell at one point. Keep some cleaning supplies in your car, just in case. Are you a science fiction fan? I have some good news for you then. Turns out that flying cars may be closer to us than we think. And it's not just because they look cool. Manufacturers are looking into developing such vehicles for practical reasons too. For starters, our standard roads are getting pretty congested as time goes by. We'll need some other means of transportation in the future to be able to cope with a large number of vehicles. You can find loads of flying car concepts online for all preferences. There's one that looks like a giant drone, and another one like a mini airplane. The simplest designs just took a car and put wings on it. Some cars will light up a snowflake on the dashboard every now and then. 
In case you're wondering, it's a sensor, and a pretty important one too. It shows the exterior ambient temperature. It gets activated when there's a road warning due to a sharp drop in temperature. It may sometimes even come with an audio warning or a message on your dashboard to inform you that the roads may be getting icy, so you can either adapt the speed or change to the appropriate tires if necessary. Cars these days aren't just adapted for the cold season. They come with cool features to help out during the summer months, too. I'm talking about those neat sun visors. Check your car to see if it has this added bonus feature. We know they twist to help the driver out even when they're not driving directly toward sunlight. Some visors can also extend, so they can provide shade to a larger area. If yours can't extend, there's a simple solution. Buy a sun visor extender. You can even find them online. They work by being attached to your existing sun visors or the windows for better shade coverage and visibility. Now, your car might have another hidden feature. Well, it's technically not in the car, but in its tires. These days, some cars come equipped with foam-filled tires. They were created to fix the problem of air-filled ones that often went flat. Why? Well, because foam-filled tires have many of the same benefits as air-filled tires without the danger of leaks. Regular air-filled tires can sometimes lose air over time, even if there hasn't been any damage. In most cars with this feature, the tires are not completely filled with either foam or air. They have a mix of both. A bonus of these modern tires is that they make the cars quieter. Generally, electric cars make less noise, but because of that foam, they end up being as quiet as a cat. Some people like the fact that they're quiet, while others prefer that classic screeching or rumbling that vehicles make. But even people who like the sound of regular engines might like the quietness of these new models because they are still very fast. Now, if you're as watchful as I am, You've probably noticed those zigzag patterns on the edges of some packages, like bags of chips or chocolate bars. It's clear that they're there to make it easier for you to tear the plastic. But why does it tear so easily? Now, plastic is made of long molecules called polymers. You can compare it with a fabric made of long threads. But the scale is much smaller, and these strands aren't actually woven together. What ridges do is remove the support of the surrounding polymer fibers. When the edge is flat, the molecules are surrounded and kind of protected by their mates. But if the edge is uneven, molecules on the peaks of the ridges are much more exposed to mechanical damage. Plus, such an uneven edge allows you to apply more force to a specific point, the groove. And once that point fails, the groove moves to the next point, causing more tearing. And this process continues until you stop applying the force or until you're done tearing the packaging apart. But this isn't the only packaging secret. I'm about to reveal the most unexpected packaging facts. Now, is this what the future of packaging looks like? A Swiss company has invented a magic juice box. It's made of agar-agar seaweed gel and water. It can only contain short-term smoothies and juices. The box also withers at the same rate you consume the product inside. Wow, doesn't it sound like the future is here? That overwhelming smell of coffee that literally hits you once you open a jar with instant coffee? This scent is actually just a coffee aroma sprayed onto the lid. It's done to provide you with the enticing smell of freshly ground coffee. One of Korea's leading manufacturers of instant noodles has come up with innovative packaging for their production. It can be safely used in microwaves. The company claims that some additional material used in this packaging can remain intact without melting, even at high temperatures. Well, it'll definitely make the process of heating up your lunch much faster. Now, almost all food we consume has an expiration date. But this rule doesn't apply to water. Hmm. But how come there's an expiration date on every water bottle? There's no paradox here. This expiration date refers to the bottle, not the water inside. They say that regardless of the brand, all chips have a best before date that ends on a Saturday. It's because a production week starts on a Sunday and correspondingly ends on a Saturday. 
Well, I've checked my stash, and it seems to be true. Go look at yours and write in the comments what you found out. Bubble wrap was originally designed to serve as textured wallpaper. It was invented in 1957 by engineers Mark Chavons and Alfred Fielding in New Jersey. They sealed together two shower curtains, trapping inside a smattering of air bubbles, and wanted to sell the resulting product as an innovative kind of wallpaper. Unfortunately, the product turned out to be a failure as wallpaper. Then the inventor started selling it as greenhouse insulation. But it wasn't until 1961 that the material's protective qualities were discovered. And the first client that used bubble wrap as a packaging material was IBM. This company used it to protect its big IBM 1401 mainframe computer during shipment. Now, people love personalized products. According to researchers, a whopping 52% of online customers are more willing to repeat their purchases from a company when they get personalized shipping boxes. If you've ever seen someone unboxing Apple products, you probably noticed that the company used very laconic packaging. This probably made you think that they put no effort into it, but that's not true. To achieve such a level of perfect simplicity, Apple has created a real culture around its packaging. The company's headquarters even have a special place where they come up with packaging designs for new products. Ah, look at this cute little thing! I'm sure you know this one is a beaver, but little do you know that the goo they use to mark their territory can also be used in food production. Scientifically, this goo is called castoreum, and this substance has a prominent musky and vanilla scent. Hey, just picture it. A group of food scientists discovered it, and they're like, hey, why don't we incorporate the beaver's goo into some recipes? Yeah, bro, cool idea. It smells sweet. We can add it to ice creams, desserts, you name it. Well, actually, it's been used for hundreds of years in things like medicine and perfume and flavorings, but not so much lately. Meanwhile, real vanilla is quite rare and is even going extinct right now. But the flavoring that comes from underneath a beaver's behind, yeah, right, I forgot to mention that. This goo is often a mix of gland secretions and urine. Ah, oh, one strawberry ice cream for me, please. <laughs> Remember making sand pies in a sandbox when you were a kid? Yeah, you must have ingested some sand back then at least once. Well, if you want to simulate those carefree days now that you're an adult, you gotta go to Wendy's. Rumor has it they use sand as an anti-caking agent for their chili. Sounds pretty terrifying, huh? Well, let's take a closer look and not make rush decisions. First off, this very anti-caking agent is called silicon dioxide. No, it's not just sand collected on a beach. Let's say sand is just another name for silicon dioxide. It has an even more frightening name. Some call it glass powder. But anyway, it's used to prolong the life of chili and prevent eventual clumping so the texture stays perfect. Silicon dioxide is often used in flour-based baking mixtures and even in cosmetics. Unlike vanilla goo-based analog, it only has a terrifying name and quite a wide range of uses, from cement and glass to food additives. Let's talk about lanolin. Grab any cream, ointment, or even chewing gum. Right! You can find lanolin among the ingredients. Now, let's play a guessing game. What's lanolin made of? It's mostly made of plants. It's made of mud. It's made of sheep wool. Those who opted for options A and B, sorry guys, you're wrong. Maybe you'll guess it right the next time. Those who picked option C, congrats! Lanolin is produced from sheep wool. Thing is, the sheep have sebaceous glands, and they produce a sort of wool wax. This substance helps sheep shed water and helps the sheep stay dry. To get that wool wax, people first need to cut the sheep's wool and put it through a centrifuge machine. There, the oil gets separated from the hair and all the other things. But honestly, gosh, I'll never look at chewing gum the same way again. Some creepy things in your food may actually be approved by the FDA. As weird as it may sound, the FDA is okay with 30 or more insect parts per chocolate bar. Want to know more? Okay, how about rodent hair in your peanut butter? Yummy! Even though peanut butter is one of the best controlled FDA products out there, they don't see anything bad in a couple of rodent hairs per jar. Now, let's check your intuition. Another guessing game for those who failed the lanolin test. 
Question 1. How much mold is acceptable in apple butter, according to the FDA? Not that much, actually. 12% mold is acceptable. Question 2. How much mold is okay for cherry jam? Things are getting stinkier, as 30% mold is okay for cherry jam. The last one. How about black currant jam? Ready? 75% moldy black currant jam is FDA approved. <clears throat> I don't think I'm going to eat peanut butter with jam ever again. Now imagine you suddenly notice a fly in your drink. Is it doing the backstroke? No, really. Will you finish the glass or pour another one? Well, it depends on the gender of the fly. If you get a female fly in your drink, a couple of minutes later, the taste will get funky. If a male fly wants to take a bath in your glass, it won't ruin the drink. Thing is, the female flies have certain femorones that are in charge of that funky smell. Even if you fish the fly out instantly, the drink can still lose its original taste. Egg Carton was designed in 1911 by newspaper editor Joseph Coyle from British Columbia. The main goal of this invention was to resolve a dispute between a local farmer and a hotel owner who kept complaining that the farmer's eggs were delivered broken. So, necessity is the mother of invention. Nike has created a shoe box made completely out of recycled trash materials, mainly drink containers. This box also allows its owner to wear it as a backpack. Now, paper packaging for food goes all the way back to China to the 2nd century BCE. At that time, food was often wrapped in thin sheets of mulberry bark, and later, the idea spread all over the world. And in 1879, one accident literally changed history. A worker from a paper bag factory in Brooklyn set the machine he used to the wrong settings. And instead of creasing small bags, it cut through them. When the owner of the factory readjusted the settings on the machine, he realized that it could cut and crease at the same time. This led to the appearance of mass-produced paperboard boxes. Now, researchers have found out that the process used during the manufacturing of cardboard boxes can ward off germs. Hear me out. To make cardboard, they shape layers of paper and bond them at a temperature of up to 200 degrees Fahrenheit. That's hotter than most harmful bacteria can withstand. That's why cardboard boxes are a rather safe way to package foods. After all, they come out of the manufacturing process sanitized, even when they're made of recycled materials. That little open jar icon on cosmetic packaging is the PAO, period after opening symbol. It informs consumers about the period of time a product may be used after the package is unsealed. The symbol, featuring a number followed by the letter M for months, can be seen on almost all cosmetic products. Some plastic milk containers have dents on their sides. These dents serve several purposes. For one thing, when the milk spoils, this process usually causes swelling and high-pressure buildup inside the container. That's when the dent comes in handy. It pops out and doesn't let the jug blow up. Plus, if you decide to freeze the milk, it will expand like any other liquid. And then again, the indentation will pop out and prevent the container from breaking inside your freezer. Soda bottles are always filled in such a way that there's some space between the liquid and the cap. That's because soda contains carbon dioxide. It's a gas that can expand once the bottle is heated. If there's no gap in the bottle, it can break because of the pressure building inside. Also, when you open your drink, the gases go out in the form of bubbles and the drink is likely to overflow. The gap helps with this problem, too. Now, about those horizontal lines on plastic bottles. They help hold bottles up. Some bottles are produced from soft plastic. Without the lines, they wouldn't keep their shape. Instead, they would twist easily or even break. Number 57 on a Heinz ketchup bottle has nothing to do with the product label. The truth is that the place with the numbers is the very sweet spot you should tap to get the ketchup flowing. So stop smacking the bottom of your sauce bottle and tap the 57. By the way, if you've been wondering why the number is exactly 57, not 34 or 89, this comes from the historical advertising slogan, 57 Varieties. 
created by the Heinz Company, located in Pittsburgh, USA. This advertising campaign told customers about the numerous products manufactured by the company. Now, at first sight, everything is obvious about plastic lids on disposable cups to keep your beverage inside, right? But that's not all they're capable of. As soon as you find a cozy spot and get ready to sip on your drink, you can use the lid as a coaster. If you look carefully, you'll notice special ridges that hug the bottom of your cup snugly. It's a snugly hug. The size of each lid fits the bottom of the corresponding cup. And the soft round part under a soda bottle cap keeps the carbonation from escaping. Without it, your pop would go flat in no time, probably even before you buy it. Have you ever sat in the bathroom wondering why toilet paper has fancy patterns on them? Well, if you're in there long enough, I guess you would finally get around to that. Turns out, those prints actually serve a purpose. They use the prints to fluff up the paper a bit and make it more absorbent. The unique patterns help differentiate different companies' products on the market. Also, recycled toilet paper is a thing, but it's not as popular or well-sold in the U.S. as it is in Europe and Latin America. And that's all I have to say about that. Ah, yes, one of the greatest mysteries of the snack world. Why do crackers have holes in them? Crackers start out as hydrated dough, which means that they have a lot of wet ingredients in them compared to dry ones, like flour and salt. So when hydrated dough bakes, it releases steam as they get heated through. It results in something called an open crumb. It's a texture that is full of small air pockets. If we need a perfectly crispy cracker, the dough needs to release the steam that's accumulated in there. And that's where the holes come in handy. And all that crisp is thanks to them. Now, this star, some old houses and barns have, isn't something we pay attention to, but it's very familiar. It's known as a barn star, regardless of where it's located. Put it on a castle, it's still a barn star. No one is sure where exactly it takes its roots and what it originally meant, but they became particularly common for people to use at the end of the 19th century. Apparently, people used to paint geometric figures on their barns, and each one would mean something. The star was believed to bring good luck. Some people also interpret it as signifying welcome, and they started to put it on houses. Other people just say that they look cool and only serve a decorative purpose. Now, I'm pretty sure you've noticed that electrical plugs have Mm. holes in their prongs. But what are they used Mm. for? Well, a century ago, when the first plugs were designed, they had prongs with indents. Those indents would align with bumps inside the sockets to secure them there, so that it won't fall out. Later, the indents were replaced with holes, and it was for the same purpose. Modern-day plugs don't need holes to be secured inside. They're secured with friction and pressure. Holes are still useful, though, but only during manufacturing. Some insert a rod through the holes to keep them steady while they wrap them in plastic. Other than that, holes have no use, and they are optional, so the manufacturers can decide if they have them or not. I was driving a couple of days ago and noticed those trees that you paint white at the bottom. Turns out it's a common thing to do. You see, the lower trunks of trees are painted white to help the process called sun scald. Sun scalding happens in the winter, And it's the process where extreme fluctuations in temperatures causes the bark of the tree to split. The layer of white paint serves as a long-lasting tree sunscreen. They also use this method of painting the tree trunks in orchards and tree farms. It's done to protect the young trees and give them the best possibility of surviving their first years. If you think of a prisoner, you probably imagine them wearing an orange jumpsuit. This is true, but it wasn't always like this. Originally, Prisoners in the U.S. were wearing uniforms with black and white stripes. In the early 20th century, things started to change, and switching these colors to something else was supposed to cut off the association with gangs. Orange jumpsuits appeared in the 70s. Inmates don't always wear them, only when being transported or going outside. Why? For higher visibility. Wearing striking orange, an inmate can't get away and get lost in the crowd easily. Okay, more uniforms. 
For example, astronauts always wear white, and there's a good reason for it. Space isn't the safest place, and temperatures are very extreme, going from melting hot to freezing cold. White is the color that reflects heat the best, and it's great for the spacesuit's cooling and heating systems. And the last point, in the darkness of space, white is the most visible color, so that's another bonus. Okay, it makes sense, but why don't firefighters wear white to reflect heat? Well, when you're surrounded by flames, the color of the uniform doesn't make much difference. And the problem with white is that it gets covered in ash and dust, so it doesn't look white anymore. With black or brown, there's no such problem, or at least it's not so visible. Firefighters also have reflective stripes on their uniforms, which makes them more visible. The next profession that comes to mind is police officers. And what color do they wear? Yes, dark blue. So the first police department appeared in the beginning of the 19th century in the UK. The uniform was made blue so that it was easy to distinguish between police officers and soldiers who had already been wearing white and red by then. When a police department was established in the US, a couple of decades later, they followed the tradition. Interestingly, the uniform hue has never changed. Turns out it's a very practical color. You can't see any stains on it. And it's also very helpful because at night, a police officer can track suspects down while staying unnoticed. Medical workers usually wear uniforms that are a shade of blue or green. There's a reason for it. Before the 20th century, medical staff was simply wearing their regular clothes, even when performing surgery. With the development of medicine, people started to pay more attention to how sterile everything was. So they started to wear a uniform. At first, it was white to signify purity. But the problem was that some stains were very hard to wash off from the white uniform. The color white turned greenish in no time, so it made sense to make the uniform green or blue. There's another reason too. Surgeons mostly focus on red colors during work. Blue and green are exactly on the opposite side of the spectrum. So if everything else is greenish blue, red becomes even more distinctive. Still, it's a mistake to think that all of them wear the exact same color. In many hospitals, different departments are color-coded, you may say. I mean that different departments wear scrubs of different colors so that people and other doctors can easily understand who the person is and differentiate between nurses, surgeons, and physicians right away. It helps address the correct person with a specific request. The cutest detail about the doctor's outfits, though, is probably the Crocs. Why do they love this kind of footwear? Well, it turns out they're the easiest to clean and sterilize. The foam they're made of can be hand washed or washed in the machine, and there will be no damage to the shoe whatsoever. Also, they're obviously soft, comfy, and breathable, which makes them the best shoes for people who spend days standing. Ever wondered why most doctors have sloppy handwriting? No, there's no special class in medical colleges. The reason why it's so common is that doctors are always in a rush and they write as fast as possible. So there's no time to care about their writing style. Also, keep in mind that you're not the only person they write a prescription for that day. Doctors do a lot of paperwork, often for about 10 hours straight. And they're just too tired most of the time to deal with calligraphy. In most countries, wedding dresses are typically white but this tradition isn't as old as you might think. Until the 19th century, wedding dresses were any random color. Basically, a bride just wore the best gown she owned. Often, they weren't white. You see, back in the day, with no running water, white wasn't a very practical color. Female members of royal families typically got married wearing red gowns. In 1840, Queen Victoria changed the tradition when she got married in a white gown. At first, it was frowned upon because white was associated with mourning, so it wasn't much of a festive color. Still, less than a decade later, white became widely accepted and started to be associated with purity and innocence instead. Notice that in older cartoons, quite a bunch of characters wear white gloves. I did some research and found out that back when animated movies were black and white, putting white gloves on characters was a way to make the hands stand out from the black bodies.
then animation evolved, but the glove stayed as a Disney tradition. But there are other reasons, too. Human hands make animal characters more humanized and relatable. Also, those gloves are way easier to animate, which speeds up the process. Also, many cartoon characters have four fingers. And there are reasons for that as well. First, only drawing four fingers makes the work of animators easier. While human figures were portrayed more realistically, animals and other characters could be fine with four fingers. And the creators were taking advantage of that. Also, there's a visual reason. Walt Disney himself told once that if this famous mouse had five fingers, his hands would look like a bunch of bananas. Growing up and watching morning cartoons before school, I never really understood why some of the adult characters didn't show their faces. Turns out, I was halfway to knowing the reason. The adults weren't the main focus of the shows. They were just there doing their adult stuff, while the main characters, often young age characters or animals, were doing all the fun stuff. But the adult characters were always there to keep an eye on the main characters and help them if they asked. From an animation standpoint, it was also cheaper, easier, and way less time-consuming for the animators back then not to do the faces. This way, they wouldn't have had to do the faces or synchronize the lips for every speaking segment the character might have had. They could also just reuse old animations or change as little as possible if the writers changed the script at the last minute. It was saving companies lots of time and money. Now, we've all seen a house with two chimneys, but do they have an actual purpose, or is it purely for the aesthetic? Turns out they actually did have a purpose back in the day. In the older houses that are located in colder climates, it was fairly common to have one chimney with two or more separate flues, passages for conveying gases to the outdoors. Back in the day, houses weren't as airtight as these days, so they needed more heating sources to stay warm. People had fireplaces and several wood-burning stoves. Having several flues allowed residents to vent all those gases at once. Modern houses are built way more airtight and isolated, so they don't really need more than one heating source to stay warm and cozy, even in colder climates. So, the two chimneys serve more of an aesthetic purpose. Also, they're costly to remove, even if someone lives in an older house. Sometimes, car steering wheels are grossly sticky, and here's why. Steering wheels are often covered with materials like vinyl or leather, and both of them are prone to collect surface residues like dust, food grease, oil, and sweat from your palms. Even if you don't feel like your hands are dirty when you touch the wheel, there's always something on them, and that material is happy to keep it. At some point, surface residue accumulates enough to give you that sticky feeling. You have two solutions. Either wear driving gloves or just wipe the steering wheel once in a while, and you're golden. I don't know if you've ever noticed that, but some school buses have white roofs. Apparently, roofs are painted white to ensure that the inside is cool on hot days. The thing is that dark colors, especially black, absorb light and heat. That's why asphalt is especially hot on hot days, and that's why you feel hot in dark clothes in summer. A white color, on the other hand, reflects the light and the heat, and everything gets heated less fast. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side.